I'd like to introduce Ricky and just say, um, uh, if, if I could indulge myself, uh, one brief word about my my own uh, relationship to, to uh, Ricky and his work. And I hope it's okay. We're in this like fireside format, so I hope it's okay if, yeah. I, if I call you Ricky. Uh, we're speaking. Richard T. Rodriguez is professor of media and cultural studies in English at UC Riverside. He specializes in Latina, Latino, Latinx, literary and cultural studies, film and visual culture, gender and sexuality studies, and holds additional interests in transnational cultural studies, popular music studies, and comparative ethnic studies. After receiving his BA in English here uh, at UC Berkeley and a PhD in the history of consciousness from UC Santa Cruz, he taught for several years at Cal State LA and the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign before joining the UC Riverside faculty in 2016. He's the author of Next of Kin, The Family in Chicano Chicana Cultural Politics from Duke University Press in 2009, which won the 2011 National Association for Chicano Chicano Studies Book Award, as well as uh, the book that we're here to talk about today, A Kiss Across the Ocean, Transatlantic Intimacies of British Post-Punk in U.S. Latinidad, um, also from Duke University Press. He is currently completing uh, Undocumented Desires, Fantasies of Latino Male Sexuality with Martin F. Manalanson IV, Chantal Nadeau, and Shaban B. Somerville. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm mixing up sentences with uh, those uh, scholars. He co-edited a special issue of GLQ, a journal of lesbian and gay studies titled Queering the Middle, Race and Region uh, and a Queer Midwest. And his work has appeared in numerous journals, social texts, cultural dynamics, Latino studies, critical ethnic studies, uh, Palimpsest, Aslan, American Quarterly, and various edited collections. The list is um, actually so long that I'm going to skip it if that's okay. <laughs> Um, he also serves on the editorial boards or has served on the editorial boards of American Literary History, Aslan, a journal of Chicano Studies, Latino Studies and Invisible Culture, an electronic journal for visual culture. He currently serves on the PMLA Advisory Committee. Um, he is also the 2019 recipient of the Richard A. Yarborough Mentoring Award granted by the Minority Scholars Committee of the American Studies Association. <laughs> and is the co-principal investigator on the University of California MRPI grant titled the Global Latinidades Project, Globalizing Latinx Studies for the Next Millennium. His show, Dr. Ricky on the radio, can be heard weekly, KUCR. <laughs> um, so I'd just like to say two words on a personal note as part of this introduction. One is that I was part of the American Studies Association Minority Scholars Committee that established the Richard Yarborough Mentoring Award, and uh, Richard Yarborough is a, a scholar of African American literature and African American studies at UCLA. He was one of my mentors as a graduate student, and um, that that award is very difficult to get, and is a real testament um, not only to uh, Ricky's scholarship, but to the warmth and generosity and collegiality um, that he brings to the profession and has brought to uh, a lot of people. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. And then um, just to say on a personal note, um, I've known Ricky since I was a graduate student and he was a finalist for a, a job at UCLA that um, they made a mistake of not giving him. <laughs> um, and when I was a junior faculty coming up, I uh, was previously at Northwestern, so we were both in the Midwest. And uh, Ricky very kindly invited me to give a talk at um, Urbana-Champaign with the first invited talk uh, first time I was given sort of an invitation to visit a campus um, and it, it felt like the first time my work was being kind of legitimated and uh, it was a really important moment for me as a junior scholar and I, I really um, appreciated it and continue to appreciate um, Ricky your mentorship and um, everything that you do in the profession so I'm so grateful uh, that you're here today and that we get to celebrate your work. Um, so the, um, rather than a traditional book talk, um, our format today is going to be um, a moderated conversation. Um, I, uh, Ricky and I have been corresponding and I have a series of questions about the book and hopefully this will uh, become organic and not just be sticking to a bunch of questions. Um, and we'll do that for about um, 45 minutes um, and then um, uh, hopefully you'll have questions and we can have a, a broader engagement. Um, so um, we just want to start um, the conversation then about a kiss across the ocean. And um, we'll do so 
Vicky, by uh, I'll just ask you to tell us how this book came about. When you when did you begin researching the connections between post punk uh, British post punk music and U.S. Latinidad? And I think also I can't tell. I mean, I see one Pet Shop Boys T-shirt. <laughs> Tell from the rest of the crowd that it seems like we, you know, uh, maybe a definition of post punk music might be helpful for a few people maybe in the, in the audience as well. Sure. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to thank thank you, John, for that amazing introduction. And you know, it's it, it's a real treat to to be in conversation with you. And I appreciate everything that you've done for me and uh, and for everyone else um, in the profession and people who are coming up. So. Um, it, it's quite an honor to be here with you. And then I'd also like to thank uh, Greg and Frida for um, really helping facilitate this and getting me here in person. Uh, so thank you. And, and then to uh, Professor Lara Perez for, uh, for the invitation. And it means a lot to me to be here. You know, it's, it's nice to come back here and, you know, to, I like coming here and, and being anonymous and walking down Telegraph and going to the bookstores and record stores, but, but it's also nice to see friends and colleagues and people who, who mean the world to me and, and just help me get to where I am now. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, and so, yeah, to start with a question, uh, maybe I'll start with a, a definition of, of post-punk. Uh, you know, there are some who believe that, you know, kind of, it's a very contained uh, form of music that that emerges after the initial punk scene in the mid uh, to late 1970s, um, and it's a, a musical style that begins to incorporate um, more synthesizers and a you know wide variety of musical sounds other than uh, the you know noted three chord. Uh, you know, element that comprises a traditional punk song. And so, um, you know, a lot of artists who had been influenced by the initial punk scene decided to, um, you know, draw on that um, ethos of, you know, going against the grain, uh, but then also kind of fleshing out the musical sound. Uh, so that way there wasn't a necessary adherence to, you know, a, more conventional punk song, and so in the late in the early 1980s, you hear this, you know, this emergence of, of of synthesizer music that draws from punk, but then also from disco and um, other electronic bands like Kraftwerk from Germany, um, Yellow Magic Orchestra from Japan, uh, and so it's kind of a you know much more broader you know sound uh, than than punk per se, but it never parts ways with um, the way that there is a punk element that kind of defies, you know, authority. Um, and, and for me, post-punk uh, is a broad enough category to also think about, you know, issues of gender and sexuality that were, for, you know, were there in the initial punk scene, but kind of come to fruition with the emergence of, uh, of, of performers like um, Peter Shelley or, you know, even Boy George or Annie Lennox from Rhythmics. And, you know, oftentimes the, 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 the music is called New Wave, but I like holding on to this category of post-punk because it really does connect to punk um, and that defiant stance that still, I think, is at the heart of this music. Uh, the project really began, um, you know, I, well, okay, it, it started in Chicago <laughs> and I was at my dining table and I got an email from a friend and I can't remember who it was, uh, but it was an announcement for a symposium on the Pet Shop Boys uh, to take place in Edinburgh, Scotland. And I was so excited um, that I wrote a proposal and sent it out in about within 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And one of the organizers responded immediately and said, this is nice, but you need to flush it out a little more uh, and you know, resubmit it. So I did. And Eventually it was accepted and I was so excited because not only was I going to present on a band that I'd been listening to since um, I was a teenager, but because I was thinking about like what these connections were between these musicians and Latinx bands. Uh, and, you know, around, around this time you start seeing this proliferation of, of articles, you know, trying to crack the code as to why Chicanos in particular were so drawn to Morrissey, the singer um, of the lead singer of the Smiths. And 
And I was just so frustrated by, you know, those articles <laughs> because they were so myopic and, you know, they tried to, you know, say, well, it's because Morrissey's music sounds like rancheros and of course, you know, Mexicans are prone to this, you know, sentimental, you know, music. And so, you know, if it makes them cry, then of course they're going to listen to this music. I just <laughs> this total bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, I thought about like all the people that I, you know, had grown up with um, in high school and then also here at Berkeley uh, who were listening to this music. And we weren't just, you know, we were Morrissey and Spitz fans, but we were also fans of this music, um, you know, in a much broader, you know, sense. And so um, this was an opportunity for me to kind of make an intervention. And so I was thinking about the way that the Pet Shop Boys had been influenced by Latin freestyle of the 1980s. And they were listening to bands like Expose uh, which consisted of a Chicana from uh, from LA and uh, an Italian American um, and I believe an uh, American from uh, Miami, and they hear this music while they're in the United States and they want to make a song that sounds exactly like Expose's Point of No Return, and so they connect with Louis Martinet, a Cuban American producer in Miami, and they make the song titled Domino Dancing. And so if you listen to Domino Dancing alongside Point of No Return, they sound almost the same, uh, you know, in terms of the music. Uh, and so that was the, the presentation that I gave in Scotland. And then I just started making connections, you know, Susie and the Banshees, for example, or thinking about Susie Sue's relationship with the, the queer Chicano um, guitarist, Kid Congo Powers, um, who was a former member of the Cramps and uh, the Gun Club and um, has kind of, you know, you know, come to prominence, or I don't want to say come to prominence, but kind of become, uh, uh, come into the spot, the public view because of his recently published memoir, and also the fact that he played guitar on the prank song, The Goo Goo Luck, which was popularized by the television, uh, or the, uh, the cable show Wednesday, you know, the classic scene where Wednesday's, you know, dealing with the dance and gets to the cramps, Goo Goo Luck. Um, anyway, I'm probably, probably saying way too much, um, but yeah, so then the project just kind of took flight from there, and, you know, I imagined it as a, as a book down the road, because I was working on a second book, uh, which you mentioned, um, and I just got bored with it, and then when the pandemic <laughs> hit, you know, I was taking care of my dad, and um, without, you know, well, it was either right or fall into a deep state of depression, so mm -hmm. I wrote and wrote with some friends and uh, stuck to a writing schedule and it just kind of flourished from there. Yeah. That's remarkable. I mean, it really, um, um, to, to hear that the writing actually came so, I guess, recently that, you know, the pandemic's yeah. still ongoing. So, yeah, exactly. Um, because it, 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 um, it, you know, I hope everybody reads the book because it's beautifully written and it reads like the kind of book that went through a decade of revisions and, and thinking. And I know that it was percolating in your mind for, for much longer than that writing schedule um, uh, might, might suggest. But I wanna um, actually build on or, uh, something that you said in the, the, um, the way that the book kind of came about, which is that reaction to cultural critics linking Chicanos with Morrissey, right? Like that's bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. And it does seem like one of the important threads of the book is you responding to various ways that um, either within families or within say schools or cultural institutions, um, people seem really intent on policing other people's tastes. Yeah. So, you know, this, uh, one of the things you say, for example, is that go, going to concerts and maybe people will say like, this music isn't for you, right? right? Um, or another way, uh, another way this comes in is actually in a few of the artists that you talk about, like Culture Club, you have a long footnote when you first bring up Culture Club of Boy George, um, responding to music critics who don't think Culture Club is good enough to sort of take seriously. Mm -hmm. It's another kind of, you know, policing. And I wonder um, if you could comment on why why it's so important to push back against that kind of policing um, and to allow yourself and allow ourselves to like the things that we like, take pleasure from them and, and um, appreciate them. Like what's, what's at stake in that? Yeah, thanks, that's a great question. You know, I think answering the second uh, question first, you know, I think about like how 
sometimes we're drawn to forms of popular culture that later in life seem really embarrassing right? mm -hmm. uh, or you're made to feel embarrassed about them and i remember you know being in a in a um in a bar in champagne and a colleague who's a musicologist um sat at the table with a bunch of friends and he just started like berating culture club you know oh you're so you know pathetic and sad and blah, blah, blah. And, and I just thought to myself, dude, you weren't listening to like this sophisticated music when you were 13 years old. I'm sure that, you know, there was something that, that kind of, you know, that you latched onto. And then, you know, when you kind of realized that you had to be more sophisticated, you either got rid of those records and tapes and um, pretended that you never owned them um, or just kind of hid them in the back of the closet or something. But, um, but I wanted to bring that out uh, because I think, you know, we're, drawn to popular culture for a variety of reasons. And I think, you know, for me, Culture Club was kind of the first step towards um, the familiarity with this wide expanse of music that I would eventually be introduced to. And it was through, you know, not just the music itself, but also the music magazines that I was reading at the time, uh, where, you know, the interviews with people like Roy George and, um, and other pop stars were talking about the music that had influenced them. And because, you know, finding out about these bands through these interviews, you know, that was kind of what led me to bands like David, or Roxy Music or David Bowie and uh, T-Rex and Sparks and all of these other groups that, you know, that eventually, you know, I was drawn to and it kind of broadened my, my musical vista. Uh, but it was, I don't want to get rid of, you know, the, I don't want to deny that that was kind of like the formative influence for me, um, a, a band like that. And I think you know the the whole policing of people's tastes is is not anything new, um, but I also think that you know because we're sometimes drawn to things that seem unlikely um, or don't correlate with our respective you know ethnic or racial identities um, that we're seen as anomalies or we're made to feel like we don't have any kind of um, you know we don't have the right to lay claim to them. Uh, but I just think about like, you know, my own family, you know, my mom growing up in Southern California in the 1950s and 60s and being a huge fan of the Beatles and, um, and you know, the, Brit the first wave of the first British invasion, um, you know, the Stones and, you know, the animals and all those groups and, and, you know, I grew up listening to that music and it just seemed so, you know, on par with my relationship to music that, um, you know, when people would try to kind of police my own musical taste, it was like, you know, who are you to you know, make these assumptions about me? And I kind of see that happening with my students as well. You know, I, have, I always have these young women of color who come into my classes and they're huge BTS fans. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it prompts them to want to go to Korea, you know, and, and learn Korean. And I have a, a former student who um, is Muslim Pakistani and she taught herself Korean so she could, you know, understand the lyrics of the B of BTS songs. And I thought, wow, that's just kind of opening up, you know, a pathway for her, not just in terms of music, but it kind of leads to these other connections and interests uh, that I think, you know, is kind of what my relationship to this music is. Um, uh, one of the um, one of the things you said there just reminded me actually of a, a part of your book that I really love and for selfish reasons, because I'm I'm currently in a class teaching Juno Diaz's novel, The Brief Wonders Life of Oscar Wow. Mm -hmm. And um, in that in that novel, one of the characters, um, Lola um, De Leon is a Susie the Banshees fan, right? She and there's a it's a big sort of pivotal moment in the novel. She shaves her head, she goes punk. Um, and she is uh, wearing a Susan the Banshee's T-shirt, and you, you, uh, I, one of the illustrations in your book actually comes from uh, the Hernandez brothers. The illustration from the New Yorker that shows Lola and the Susan the Banshee's T-shirt. Um, when you were when you were saying, you know, that that um, that kind of shock of um, you know people assuming that um, this music isn't for you, it doesn't seem to correspond to your race or ethnicity. You know, Oscar Wilde is all about that, right? That um, for Oscar and for Lola, their interest in like nerd genres or in punk doesn't seem to have anything to do with sort of the Dominican experience. But it does serve a different purpose for them, which is it's very affirmative of their own, you know, senses of being outsiders within their families, within their schools, their peer groups. And so I, 
I wonder, um, I'd, I'd love to hear you talk about this a little bit more in your, in your first answer, you, uh, your first comments about the book, you're talking about the importance of post-punk, um, it's, it's uh, experimentation and representation of queer uh, identities especially, and um, that's a, you know, a really important theme throughout the book. How do you think this, you know, post-punk in particular resonates um, for racialized or uh, sexually minoritized um, youth, right? Who are, you know, trying to trying to find something that corresponds to their sense of just being outside, right? And uh, yeah. you know, wanting wanting to wanting to feel affirmed and wanting to maybe also defy whatever the structures that are are marginalizing them. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's it's fascinating how you know, kind of a new body of Latinx literature. You know, it, it, it's written by people who are from uh, from my generation, and and it seems like it's inevitable that these bands are mentioned um, in in their work, and it makes perfect sense to me. And and they're oftentimes used precisely in the way that you had mentioned, which is that they kind of represent a certain otherness to which you know these kids who are growing up are you know gravitating towards because. It's not only um, an example of a way to be different in the world, but it's also um, music that provides some kind of solace as an outsider, whether it's you know being a person of color or being queer or being a queer person of color. Um, and you know, I think you know having that music um, available to us was was really important because it represented another way to you know to exist in the world. And it may not have correlated with our identities in a very concrete or, you know, in a direct way, but the music in many ways, I think, helped us feel seen. And I think this is how um, the music functions in these, in these literary works, that the music kind of gives the characters a way out um, or to think of themselves um, in ways that are different from their peers um, and their res respective surroundings. Uh, but then it also, provides a kind of energy, which is essential, I think, for, you know, just navigating a hostile environment. Um, you know, I have a 13 year old niece who's growing up in the Central Valley, and she's already, you know, kind of adopted this, you know, outsider status. She loves, you know, going to, you know, secondhand stores and um, wearing, wearing vintage clothes, and she's already being called a faggot, and, you know, people telling her she looks like a boy. And of course, it just pains you know, me inside to hear that. But then she'll tell me, you know, KK, they're just stupid. They don't know anything. And, and, and it's the music that she's gravitating towards that kind of gives her this sense of empowerment that I can totally relate to. I mean, that was my relationship to that music as well. And I think this is how it, it operates for these characters in, in these literary texts, that it, it fuels them, it gives them a sense of empowerment. It offers a kind of force field against all of the hostility that they experience, um, you know, on a daily basis. Um, it's, it's such a beautiful and, and personal um, response, and it, it just makes me think that um, for those of you who um, haven't had a chance to, to read Ricky's book yet, um, you'll you're in for a real treat.